The dating of the White Sands footprints is an extremely complex topic with many working parts that are heavy on mind-numbing geochronology. There's no way around it. It is very dense, and it's hard for the layperson to understand. Before we get in over our heads with Dr. Dave Rohde, Dr. Lauren Davis, and Dr. Pompiani, we're going to sit down and define the geologic geomorphic context of the Tularosa Basin and the White Sands tracks and trackways. Understanding how these tracks and trackways fit into the broader stratigraphic geomorphic context of the basin is crucial for understanding how and why tracks end up where they were found. So let's get started. So what makes the Tularosa Basin so unique? Yeah, I know, it has lots of megafauna tracks and trackways, but all of those tracks and tra trackways are impressed into gypsum sediment. Gypsum is only common in arid basins of the southwest United States where sources of calcium sulfate exist. One problem with this is that gypsum is really not that common in the southwestern part of the United States. So, let's look at the map to the left there. That's a map of arid soils, and each one of those different colored polygons represents a certain desert soil forming in a certain type of sediment. Purple polygons indicate soils that formed in gypsum sediment. So, as we Look across the basin and range, particularly in areas where we know we've had paleo lakes, not a lot of purple. If we look at New Mexico, one thing that we do notice is that there's a lot of purple. There, there's a lot of gypsum in New Mexico. Uh, there's gypsum in the Tularosa Basin. Uh, there's also extensive deposits in the southeastern part of the state. And there's a pretty large amount of it in West Texas and Guadalupe Mountain National Park. The reason why New Mexico has so much gypsum is because New Mexico has a lot of Permian age calcium sulfate deposits, and that landscape has been crinkled by tectonic processes over time. The Tularosa Basin is bounded by two dominant mountain ranges, the San Andreas Mountains to the west and the Sacramento Mountains in the east. In those tilted fault block mountains, you have Permian age calcium sulfate deposits. During wet pluvial periods, rainfall dissolves that exposed gypsum, and all of those sulfate solutes get washed down to the bottom of the basin floor where it loads up in a Pleistocene Paleo Lake that we locally refer to as Paleo Lake Otero. During arid dry periods, the lake will dry out and you'll have the precipitation of thick evaporite beds. During these arid periods, the dominant southwest northeast wind will scour out the dry lake bed and it'll take all of that sediment and deposit it on the leeward side of the basin, creating the white sands dune shield. Now, let's zoom in and take a closer look at the Paleo Lake Otero deflation basin. Scouring out of that dry lake bed happened episodically over time. During arid periods, the water table would drop and all of that dry sediment would be scoured out by the southwest northeast winds. This would create an erosional scarp and like a bathtub green, it can be traced laterally around the perimeter of the Lake Otero deflation basin. These wind deflationary events that scoured the basin floor left two prominent erosional scarves. Locally, they're referred to as the L1, L2 erosional shoreline. The L1, which is the upper scarp, is thought to have formed during the terminal Pleistocene, while the L2, which is the lower scarp, formed sometime during the Middle Holocene. These two events are responsible for exhuming the majority of the megafauna track surfaces in the Lake Otero deflation basin. The 21 to 23,000 year old footprint sequence, which everybody calls locality two, is located about two meters below the L1 erosional shoreline on the eastern margin of Paleo Lake Otero. Locality one is located on the western margin of Paleo Lake Otero, just below the L2 erosional shoreline. This is the site that contains the famous human sloth interaction trackway. Now, let's talk about how tracks and trackways are preserved in the Tularosa Basin. Most of the tracks are formed in wet, moist sediment, so they're usually found on the lake margin. To me, this type of lake margin deposit would probably resemble that of a mud flat. These are areas that are typically very dynamic and are rapidly aggrading. They usually contain couplets consisting of lacustrian, alluvial, and aeolian sediment. Since the lake margins rapidly aggraded, it's very common to find stack sequences or stratified track surfaces 
in the lake margin deposit. Well, how this happens is that typically when the lake is at high stand, the margins of the lake are covered by water. When the lake dries out, the margins are exposed and it creates this Atosha pan type setting. It would look like a salt pan. The megafauna would move around that salt pan and go along the margins of the lake while they try to procure resources. Sediments wash in by alluvial fans onto that salt pan. Yielding sediment gets blown in, and that buries the tracks and trackways. And then the lake rebounds again, burying. And that's just rinse and repeat for thousands of years, and that's what creates that vertical sequence of track surfaces. It also creates those couplets composed of eolian sediment interbedded with lacustrian sediments interbedded with sheet wash deposits. It's that type of environment where you're going to have the best preservation of tracks. Now, let's take some time and look at a few representative stratigraphic sections located around the margins of Paleolake Otero. Here's a picture of a backhoe trench excavated on the eastern shoreline of Paleolake Otero. This trench is approximately two meters below the L1 erosional shoreline, and it is around 300 feet north of locality 2. The upper part is what the trackway stratum looks like. The blue blotches are intraclass mixed into the trackway strat. Uh, this unit was dated using rupia seeds and came out around 20 to 23,000 years ago. The next photo is a lacustrine sequence on the western side of Paleolake Otero. Um, as you can see here, you have a trackway strat at the bottom of that sequence, and that dated around 30,000 years ago. And then there's a high stand deposit above it, and then another track surface, and then it's blanketed with Aeolian dunes that date to around 14,000 years ago. Next, it's a photo of a soil profile on the western margin of Paleolake Otero. At the base of it is another uh, trackway strat, which dates to 25 to 35,000 years ago. This unit contains proboscidean tracks, sloth tracks, direwolf tracks, so on and so forth. Above it, once again, Lake Otero, high stand sediments, and then it's capped by another trackway strat that dates to around 15,000 years ago. It's worth mentioning that when you do date these trackway deposits, these mudflat type settings always correlate to regional low stands and paleo lakes. And here are just a few more pictures of some Lake Otero stratigraphy. Really just some beautiful profile pics, especially the photo on the left. The next one is a backhoe trench that was dug in the center of the deflation basin. Uh, beautiful stratigraphy, those organic rich layers. When you first dig the pit, it smells like hydrocarbons, like oil. Amazing. Along the western lake margin, track surfaces are buried by Paleolake sediments deposited 25,000 years ago. These surfaces can be laterally traced to the east where it has been exhumed by erosion. It is on these deflated surfaces that many Pleistocene megafauna trackways and human footprints can be found. On these deflated surfaces, the largest concentration of fossilized late Pleistocene megafauna tracks and trackways in North America and possibly the world can be found. Fossilized footprints belonging to extinct Ice Age sloths, mammoths, felids, direwolves, and camelids can be found on these eroded surfaces. The photo to the left illustrates what exhumed Ice Age sloth tracks look like. Note the kidney bean shape of the print and the long gait. The upper right shows what a mammoth track looks like. In the lower right hand side of the slide is a picture of a modern day elephant footprint taken in the Atosha Pan in Namibia. Next is a photograph of a cross section of a mammoth track. Note the displacement rim around the edges of the print. This ring was created by the weight of the animal walking across a saturated surface. It's essentially the mud that squirts out around the print as the animal walks across the wet surface. The presence of a displacement rim around a track tells you that the surface is still intact and has not been altered by erosion. Hands down, this is my favorite megafauna track in the basin. Next is a photograph of a buried mammoth track along the western shoreline of Paleolake Otero. Note the deformed bits underneath the track, which were created by the immense weight of the animal. Also, since this track's surface is buried, it remains intact. Next is a photograph of a camelid trackway. This trackway has undergone significant erosion and has become pedestal. When this happens, the original surface that both humans and megafauna walked on is gone. Next is another photograph of a severely deflated pedestal mammoth trackway. 
It is very common to find human footprints in these deflated contexts. However, most of the purported human footprints are impressed into the sediment, while the surrounding megafauna tracks and trackways are pedestal. The difference in microtopographic relief suggests that they are not contemporaneous. Well, there you have it, folks. Please keep in mind that these interpretations come from my own experience working out there, and they may differ from those of the White Sands team. But different interpretations are a healthy part of science. Now that you have the basic understanding of the geologic geomorphic context of the tracks and trackways, it's time to dive into the geochronological hard stuff. I hope you enjoyed the video and found it informative. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Signing off, Dr. Dave Rochelle.